Well, good news, Patrick, because uh, Al Baghdadi uh, was uh, removed from the planet. Yes, the Caliph is dead. Long live the Caliph. There will be others following in his footsteps. But yes, there's a big announcement. Uh, to, to great dramatic fanfare, Donald Trump's announced the killing of ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And it was, uh, it, it didn't disappoint in terms of theatrics, this one. If, if you thought that you could top the Osama bin Laden raid in terms of theatrics and uh, loose ends that are very difficult to tie together, well, think again. Uh, this tops it by orders of magnitude. But let's look at uh, what uh, some of the other governments are saying right now, Mike. Well, there's uh, Dmitry Peskov, the spokesman for the Kremlin. Uh, he said, if this information about al-Baghdadi's death is indeed confirmed, in general, we could speak about the US president's serious contribution to the fight against international terrorism. So uh, they, they are requiring uh, confirmation, although they're quite positive about it. There's a big if there. The first word is very key there, if. So Russia's hedging its bets clearly on that one. So, but uh, it, it, this is, now there's so many twists and turns to this story. Let's just start off here and we'll work our way backwards. Trump faces renewed backlash for abandoning the Kurds in Syria as it is revealed that it is Kurdish intelligence that helped to locate al-Baghdadi in his compound in Idlib, by the way. Idlib is the province in Syria, uh, is currently occupied by al-Qaeda militants that the West keeps saying is home to peaceful protesters. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also the, the base of ISIS as well, as we found out. Well, apparently, if you believe this story anyway. But uh, so they helped to locate, the Kurds helped to locate al-Baghdadi where he blew himself up and three of his children uh, in a dead-end tunnel basically. And the subtext is important. The da Daily Mail is always very useful in showing us what the establishment want us to believe. Uh, the U.S. military operation to strike ISIS leader was a success. Kurdish intelligence helped to nail him, etc. Uh, Baghdadi was tracked down following the arrest and interrogation of one of his <laughs> wives and a courier. This is, reminds us of the bin Laden narrative and Trump's abrupt decision to pull out the troops from Syria apparently jeopardized the operation, but by the same token, they're saying that because of that decision, Pentagon officials were forced to green light the raid to take place before their troops, spies, helicopters, or withdrawn from Syria. Mike, now this begs the question, if you believe what you just read there, that means that they have always known where a Baghdadi has been residing, and they simply took this opportunity to push the button uh, on this operation. If you believe what you're reading, okay, right. there's reasons for me to believe and many of our viewers as well that some of this doesn't actually add up and we'll go through some of those details in a minute, Mike, but, but uh, it, it's funny how the, the media is already hedging on, on, on this issue. So I find it quite amazing. But uh, let's look at what Donald Trump is claiming uh, for a minute, okay? So this is what Trump is claiming. Firstly, we killed the world's number one terrorist. <clears throat> That's debatable. Uh, there's a few governments that I would put ahead of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi on that list. But let's move on. Baghdadi was whimpering and crying as our dogs chased him down the tunnel. Now, the question is, how would you know that he was whimpering and crying when dogs were chasing him down the tunnel. We might have a few possible answers for that, which we might explore in a minute, but it's very difficult to, to square that circle. And he ignited his suicide vest rather conveniently, uh, and the tunnel collapsed, and he died like a dog, according to Donald Trump. So interesting choice of words. We'll go into that a little bit more in a, in a minute. We checked his DNA, it's him. So he ignited his suicide vest, uh, he, the tunnel collapsed, and we checked his DNA. So I'm, I'm trying to work out exactly how those three things happened mm. and in what order, who checked the DNA, uh, who picked up the sample, where was it processed, how, how long did this take uh, to complete, and so forth. So let's keep going, the last one, the world is a much safer place without him. Well, I mean, I certainly feel much safer. You do, yeah. Well, Americans do. Americans must must be sleeping better at night because of this. So the, we'll, those are the th claims. Now, we'll, we'll actually address all of these claims 
by looking at a few details of this story. So, let's start here. Al-Baghdadi, dead again. Well, a lot of people have pointed out, and I'm sure a lot of people have, have seen these uh, lists online. Uh, Baghdadi, previously reported, killed not once, not twice, not three times, not four times. Six times. Not five times, <laughs> but six times. So, dead again. You remember that film? Yeah. Well, on a pastiche of that film's title, we'll ask that question once again, dead again. So, this could be potentially the sixth time. Here is a man that you might feel sorry for. Just check out the expression on his face. This is Trump's new head of the Joint Chiefs. He's got a very tough job, make no mistake about. This is General Mark Milley, new head of the Joint Chiefs. He said, I know the president had planned to talk to the unit and the unit members, but I don't know what the source of that was. I assume it was uh, talking directly to unit members. He's talking about the whimpering and the crying mic. Uh. So this is the head of the Joint Chiefs saying he doesn't know where Trump got that piece of information. So it, he doesn't know, even the head of the Joint Chiefs, who was in charge of all these units, uh, he didn't hear this. So he's wondering how did the president know what emotional state Baghdadi was in when they were making chase. So that's interesting. And uh, there's only one way you could probably know in this, and that if there was a canine terror cam attached to uh, Conan, the dog's name is Conan, attached to Conan's head, and that somehow recorded the distraught emotional state of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi as he ran down the tunnel in his suicide vests with three children in tow, being chased by a German shepherd uh, Do we know if Conan survived? Uh, we, th we think Conan might have survived with minor injuries, right. uh, according to some reports, but yet uh, haven't had any specifics. The dogs survived, I, I'm told, with minor injuries. So if, if the dog survived, Mike, he couldn't have been very close to Baghdadi if he ignited his suicide vest. So right. he wouldn't have been able to capture the whimpering and the crying, e even if he was wearing a high-tech terror cam, uh, like this experimental piece of equipment, uh, which is being used by U.S. and other NATO member states. Br Britain's also pioneering a dog, dog cam tech. What's interesting about this, Patrick, is that uh, rather than questioning this, uh, the mainstream press have grabbed the narrative with both hands. Uh, and this is typical. Uh, Washington Post here, a dog helped kill Ag uh, Baghdadi, joining a long history of canine war heroes. Now, of course, dogs have been used uh, in the military for, for a long time, and, and they've performed... Uh, extremely well in a lot of cases, but there's no, there's, it's just incredible. There's no skepticism in in the mainstream press anymore. Where is skepticism over Trump's statements from the from the press here? They seem to be, uh, depending on what what subject we're talking about, they seem to be willing to take his words uh, and run with them. Well, all the news feeds are official sources. Uh, in fact, um, you know, on, on the issue of of the DNA testing. This is the next big issue. So on the issue of the DNA testing, according to Reuters, Baghdadi's remains were transported to a secure facility uh, to confirm his identity with forensic DNA testing. This is, uh, well, this is Miley here. Now, how did they have a DNA sample of Baghdadi beforehand? And people will say, well, he was interned in Kambuka uh, in Iraq before the formation of ISIS back in 2000. And four, they must have DNA tested all the prisoners there. Mm. That's, that's not necessarily certain. We don't know that. Mm. So that's one claim there. But here's how they've backed up this story. And according to anonymous sources, Mike, I believe anonymous sources, actually on this particular story, I'm not sure if anyone's put their name to it, but al-Baghdadi's underwear was stolen by a Kurdish spy in Idlib just days before the raid and DNA was tested, and so they had his DNA on file because a Kurdish spy went to Idlib, snuck into his house, and stole his underwear. How does that sound? What, what is this, Patrick? Is this, is this the, the mainstream media attempting to see, to, to see how far they can take a story and still have the public swallow it? This is what they're saying. So what I'm going to say is if this is the case, and this is how they have his DNA sample, then there's no chain of custody. Mm. There's no chain of custody between this claim and this Kurdish operative and 
Uh, so it's very difficult to say whose underwear he took. Could have been someone else in the compound. This is the same chain of custody issues that we had with the white helmets taking, quote, sarin samples mm. from Khan uh, or chlorine samples or sarin samples from Duma to high-profile chemical weapons attacks that triggered U.S. intervention. Very high-profile events, and you have no zero chain of custody whatsoever with regards to the sort of the chemical samples or the biological samples. So we have the same issue here. So it's basically it's a black hole of forensic chain of custody, mm -hmm. Syria is. And the US looks like they're operating, still operating in that, in that black hole. But you know, it doesn't end there. Here's Millie again. US military disposed of Baghdadi's remains appropriately, quote, appropriately in accordance with our standard operating procedures and in accordance with the law of armed conflict. So he's saying that uh, Baghdadi was, yes, he was blown to bits in a tunnel and they gathered his remains somehow. It doesn't say who gathered the remains. Could have been the White Helmets. Could have actually been the White Helmets, actually. Mm. And they did receive $4.5 million last week from the White House in that strange payment that was sent to the, to the White Helmets. So... I'm just asking that question. There might be a relationship between these two events. So uh, he was buried at sea, we're told. He was buried at sea. Now, this isn't the first high-profile terror leader to be buried at sea. If you remember back in 2011, well, this year it's Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi being dropped in the ocean, and in 2011 it was Osama bin Laden. So two high-profile, the top terror threats and of all time in history, Al-Qaeda leader bin Laden, ISIS leader al-Baghdadi, uh, both buried at sea. And this, apparently the U.S. government have said this is Islamic custom. So, it's, so I, and we did a little research to find out if that's actually the case. And uh, we came with some interesting results. Burial at sea. Given the gruesome nature of Baghdadi's death, it was unlikely the U.S. military followed as complete a process as it did after the Navy SEALs killed Al-Qaeda, former uh, founder Osama bin Laden in 2011 in Pakistan. So that's very ambiguous, the Reuters reports on this. And again, this is, a, I believe, anonymous government officials, mm -hmm. U.S. officials. So, and again, burial at sea. And here we go, Mike. U.S. officials who spoke on condition of anonymity did not disclose where this ritual performed uh, and how long it lasted. Two officials said they believed his remains were delivered to the sea from aircraft. So that means he, they, they flew over the Mediterranean or some sea, we don't know which sea, and they chucked his remains out the window. Uh, I don't know. It's a sort of, this is what we're feeling here, Mike, in terms of uh, <laughs> finding out what really happened. So let's, let's think about this Bin Laden narrative. Well, back in 2011, Sea burial of Osama bin Laden breaks Sharia law, says Muslim scholars. So this idea that it's an Islamic burial at sea, I mean, this is enough to fool, you know, your average American, probably Fox, watching, Fox News watching American. And so we did a little bit of research here, and this is what we found. Uh, this is from uh, an Islamic expert uh, scholar here. It's best to bury the deceased in a cemetery. Cemeteries are located on land. For those who aren't familiar with these customs, if someone happens to die on a ship uh, and it's impossible to bury him on the land, the body is then placed tightly lashed between two planks and thrown into the sea. And of course, weights are attached with this. In the case of Osama bin Laden, he would have been strapped to his kidney dialysis machine when they dumped him overboard of the USS Carl Vinson. But uh, that's another story. So that's an Islamic scholar basically saying, Actually, Islamic burial is not at, at sea. Only in the circumstances where the person is on a ship, has died at sea, and the body must, you know, must be sort of processed and, and dealt with respectfully, but in a timely manner at sea before it decomposes on, mm -hmm. on board the ship. So, and by the way, the, the U.S. didn't uh, allow for such Islamic uh, traditions, let's say, with the death of Muammar Gaddafi, who they left in a meat locker for a couple of weeks, or the sons Uday and Kuse, the sons of Saddam Hussein, who they left uh, for the world to see, kind of put them on show for a week or two uh, in Iraq. So it's very inconsistent. 
is what we're saying with this. This so it doesn't really add up. It's a very difficult uh, story to sell, Mike. Mm. Uh, we don't have any proof of anything in actuality, but we have to take our government's word for it because why would the U.S. government lie about anything? Have they ever lied about anything, anything important ever? Mm. So, so anyway, don't fear not. The number two guy has also been killed, uh, Abu al Hassan al Mahakir, and he is apparently second in command. And he's the number two guy. This is the famous term in America, number two guy, made famous by George Bush. But don't worry, there's another number two guy, Abdullah Kardash. So keeping up with the Kardash there, he's apparent. well, actually, according to Iraqi intelligence, he was killed. So a little bit of a leadership crisis here with ISIS. Not only do they not know who's going to take over, Nobody can work out who's still alive, Mike. Uh, well, I mean, it seems to be a, a requirement of leadership is that you've been killed at least once. Yeah, otherwise you're not worth your salt, right. are you? So there you go. So Trump's claim in the last one I'm going to have to highlight here, we're combating terror and keeping Americans safe. Okay, that's not actually true at all. Uh, the fact is, if you look at the evidence, if you watch the reporting that we've done on this program, you'll know that the United States is not really combating terror. They're arming, they're facilitating, they're financing Al-Qaeda affiliates for years now. Mm. And they're not keeping Americans safe by doing this. They're putting American lives at risk, not just American lives, but many other people's lives as well. ISIS posed little if no threat to the United States at any point. That's an important point. So they're using this to justify their uh, further occupation of Syria. And that's where we're going to leave that story this week. For now, but uh, we'll see what happens next. Who, who is actually going to emerge as the next big boogeyman? There'll be somebody. Mm. There'll be somebody. There'll be a new group or there'll be a new boogeyman uh, within ISIS. You can bet on it. Absolutely.